Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Jordan, Daniel, welcome to this episode of the Australian Business Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to Sydney. Welcome to Sydney. Local temperature is very fine today. So thanks for having me at the Grayspace offices and Mon- Monique behind the camera. Um, today, we're going to be giving folks 20 different ways, strategies, methods to accelerate the growth of their business. Or if they haven't got started, this can be kind of like a cheat sheet in order to help them grow their business. Um, this is a very special episode and the reason why we're doing it in person other than just being around each other, which is heaps of fun and we always laugh, is we have officially launched the Accelerator program, which many people will have heard about over the past month or so on the show. Uh, It's a very special time for us because, hey, it's live. Been working on it for a while now. The pioneers are in uh, and we are often racing with coaching and the course and those types of things. Before we get into the 20 things, therefore, I might just ask you guys a question. Um, why did you want to do that? So you guys got a successful accounting business. We've been doing the podcast for a while. Why did you want to launch the coaching program? You know, maybe we'll just go around the table. Jordan. Yeah, sure. Uh, for me, there's there's two sides to it. One being that sense of community, and the second being the advisory side of things. So as accountants, we do a lot of advisory work where we advise clients on how to grow their business. Uh, but it's more so focused on the financial side of things, interpreting cash flows, when to hire the right people. But what we found with a lot of the conversations that we're having with clients, it goes beyond that. It's not just the financial side of things. It's marketing, sales. It's looking at the business really high level and mm-hmm. then honing in on each different section or segment of the business. And we're only limited to how much we can do per client so this gives us the ability to help the masses and that sort of rolls into my first point to do it back to front Mm -hmm. but community and building that community so you can help as many people as possible and in one of the episodes or the monologues that i did i spoke about having a friendship group and how Mm -hmm. we can talk we talk every week or you send me on the phone all the time to some of my mates talking about business problems but Having someone to talk to who's in the same scenario, whether it's a different industry, different business, whatever it may be, having someone to bounce an idea off is such a valuable thing, I believe. Anyway, Mm. so for me, it's it's those those two. Well, you've been doing a lot of calls with people, particularly with the pioneers over the last month, speaking with them, learning about their businesses, and that seems to be the recurring thing. Yeah, I'd say 90%. It's just having that person to talk to and Mm. bounce ideas off because a lot of people don't don't Mm. have not and yes you do have people to talk to if it's your partner and whatnot but having other business owners who are going through the same problems having the same pain points that that we have essentially as business owners as well i think a lot of people that run a business or have run a business can understand and appreciate that particularly with partners partners are often the biggest Mm. asset in your life in terms of supporting you to do things but they don't always understand the intricacies of running a business and while they might have solutions and help prompt you it just doesn't have the same kind of gravity and the, the air is a bit different when someone that's, you know, in a relationship with, for example, uh, they give you advice. It might land a bit differently compared to someone who is completely different to you, independent of you, um, and, you know, maybe has the business experience. How about you, Daniel? Yeah, I think sort of touching what Jordan said, a lot of it does come from our experience down that advisory call a service line that we offered. And a lot of the pain points when you talk to businesses go far deeper than the financials, like Jordan said. And a lot of the times it's quite easy to help them fix their financials and understand the component of it, but it's very difficult to help them grow. And you start going down these almost really specific lines of, Mm. you know, whether it's modeling, whether it's helping with organizational charts and strategy work and sort of even going through the whys. But it sort of defeats our ex- area of expertise. And I think as we started to delve a lot of in and we started conversing between each other about his clients, between my clients, a lot of the issues were the same. Mm. There weren't new things. They weren't specific to a certain business, even though the business owner thought it was. 
there were always the same problems. So with the modeling that traditionally we use, it's time for money. And we can only help X amount of businesses. We mm. can't scale this based on our knowledge. So what's a, what, there's no better way than to sort of create a community behind it. Mm. So for we're sure. targeting the same problems, helping the, the people who are essentially got the same issues, just maybe slight tweaks to how they implement it. So mm. I think that's where we come in and being able to work with yourself, Jordan skill sets as well, we all bring something different to the table. So now the client's not getting one person's opinion on certain things. They're getting multiple experts in the fields with experience to come in and give their two cents on how they reckon they can completely change their business for mm. the better. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely the community uh, at large, isn't it? Like the mm. other people in the community, that expectation that we have, particularly amongst the pioneer group, is that they would be able to help other business owners that might be in similar situations. Mm, for sure. And another thing as well is a couple of the other questions I had, I don't know if I've actually told you guys, it's like, oh, I'm a service-based business. What if they're all e-commerce business? And me personally, I think that there's things to learn from both businesses, even though they're completely different. The good thing about having that community and the ability to post your questions and ask what you want to ask, if you ask a marketing question, traditionally, Inverted, mm. inverted commas. Traditionally, an e-commerce business is quite good at marketing. The email marketing, the cart, when you leave things in the cart, you usually hit with an email. Um, so I think you can learn across industries and across different types of businesses as well. So I think you'll be able to take pros from people in different industries and being able to ask those questions mm. and yeah, get for feedback sure. from the community. Well, so far in the program, we've had uh, e-commerce, as you mentioned. We've got trades. We've got um, civil uh, we've got legal, we've got uh, allied health, we've got basically anything. We've got online communities, um, we've got like restaurants, co coffee, these types yep. of things. Um, so many different businesses. We've got people that are transitioning businesses from like the audiovisual industry into an online medium. There's people coming from every direction and this is something that I'm a big fan of is like trying to learn outside your domain. Yeah. Like if you were just trying to solve every problem with just the, the knowledge base of what you learn in an accounting degree, or I was trying to do the same thing in a technology degree, you wouldn't understand, you wouldn't have like what worldly wisdom, you wouldn't understand what else is out there and what ideas you can bring into the field that you're operating in. And I think that's kind of the wonderful thing. Like you, we can already see this taking shape because you mentioned before, Daniel, that like you get this cross section of people and you can see all the common problems across all the businesses, but they can't see that. It's like watching a movie. You know, you only watch it from one perspective, but you can see the whole show um, and you can really piece it all together. The community will be able to do that too because they'll be sharing openly and get it from all perspectives. So the reason I wanted to do this is uh, as an investor in businesses, I've always felt that you can put your money in places that do good. And I believe that businesses solve the most problems in the world. Uh, so a lot of people who say capitalism is dead, capitalism is bad, these types of things. I strongly disagree with that because I think of all the innovations that have happened in the world over the past hundred years, most of them are to do with businesses or organizations at least that have some sort of combined motive. And um, I think one of the best, best things about Australia is we're a country of small businesses and people that are just out there hustling, whether they're a tradie, whether they're starting a service-based business, an online business, a startup, whatever. And there's no thing there's nothing out there that really seems to come across as both genuine and holistic so helping people in a holistic way but also have having genuine intent to, to provide services there are others that try to do it but a lot of them seem to want to take 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 i think that when i look at a lot of the businesses whether they're coaching or whether they're small businesses that i'd love to invest in i see a lot of them I'm like you're just on the edge of success you're at the tipping point but you can't see it because you're in it and having someone to come in and prompt you and maybe help you move in a different direction, it might only be like 10 one percenters. And all of a sudden, those one percenters stack up on top of each other and all of a sudden it becomes really meaningful. And so I'll give you a good example. It's like something that's like a task that's like manual uh, then becomes automated. All of a sudden, that's two or three hours of your week that is now back in your hands. So then in that, that two or three hours that you've got back, well, maybe you take that and you automate something else. Or maybe you hire someone or maybe you get a customer that you never would have if you were too busy. And then that has a bigger flow on effect. And maybe now you've bought yourself an extra two days. 
three days and so on. It just continues like a domino. So that's what I'm really excited about seeing that success in the community. So just to clarify before we get into the things that we're going to cover, uh, what is the course? What is the program? What is it all? So the course covers 10 core components of running a business successfully, everything from automation, technology, marketing, um, organizational charts, structuring, financials. But we didn't want to just stop there. We didn't want to just give you something that you could, you know, kind of, kind of piece together from reading five or 10 books over the next few years. We didn't want to just do that. What we wanted to do is we wanted to bring you an online community, as Jordan said, and give you everything you need to feel supported in your business, whether that's from the coaches like us or other industry experts who will come in and coach you or people like your peers and people in the industry. Um, that's what we're trying to harness with the online community. As part of that, you get weekly coaching as well. So you got the, the bedrock, which is the course with templates, downloads, etc. You get weekly coaching either from us or from people that we trust and we believe can do the job even better than us. Uh, you have the ability to network and to match with other people and, and to partner up and to find someone who is similar, maybe but slightly different so that you can work together on things. And hopefully eventually we'll have meetups and events. That would be cool. Yeah. Excited for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I we think like, get we, were, to that point. we were on the road last year, right? For all the podcasts and stuff with Rask, but um, hopefully we can do that, but with business owners yep. uh, and that would be really, really cool. So while there's the three of us behind the mics today, we're gathering this amazing team and um, trying to bring you people from across Australia, maybe even internationally over the next few years. So if you want to find out more about the program, you can head to the link in the show notes. There's also a discount that we'll have for you at the end of the show, which I'll tell you how to redeem. But why don't we jump straight into the 20 things, gents? Sound good? Sounds good. Let's do it. Right. Cool. I'm just going to pop this uh, can of sparkling mineral water. <laughs> Definitely not a beer. You can see that, <laughs> you can see that on the uh, video, although, yeah, drink responsibly. Okay, so my first thing, uh, my first thing is to start with why. Uh, and this is a Simon, Simon Sinek line. A lot of people get into business, they don't know exactly why they're doing it. Normally, we've got it on the whiteboard behind us, normally the two reasons that people do it are for freedom and for money, both of which are perfectly fine and both of which are perfectly reasonable. Uh, goals for a business owner to achieve. And I think you will if you have the right strategy and you execute. But one of the things that people don't do is they often end up in a business because they thought it was a good idea because someone told them and they saw someone around them who makes money. But as you said, Daniel, not a lot of people get either of those two things, yeah. both the freedom because they're too busy running their business mm -hmm. or the money because it's not as profitable as they thought. Yeah. Or one or the other. Yeah. They might have all the freedom in the world, but no money coming in and all the money in the world, but absolutely no freedom. Yeah. So the idea of starting with your why is just about understanding why you want to commit to this huge task in your life. So the easiest way to think about this, I think, is a task that uh, Sophie uh, once taught me, which is just, just defining what your ideal Tuesday looks like. So this is a, imagine you're sitting down on a work day. What are you doing when you get up in the morning? What are you doing? What's your routine? Where are you going to work? Who are you working with? And then how do you make your reality that reality? So imagine that perfect day, you go to work, you work on meaningful work, you're doing the tasks you want to do, you're probably not getting bogged down on the tools too much and you're probably more focusing on strategy or meeting with people. How do you make that a reality? And just by defining that, by writing it down on a piece of paper, you will find that once you get to it, you know you're there and that's a wonderful thing. Otherwise, it's like a hedonic treadmill. Yeah. You're forever running and you don't know where the end is, even if you have probably got to where you thought you would. So that's number one, start with why. For sure. Just to, I guess, play on that and to, I guess, also play devil's advocate maybe, that at the start, it's it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows. There's yeah. going to be the late nights, the early mornings, and sometimes there isn't anyone to talk to. So I think being able to accept that that is going to be the case at the start and to be okay with that, I get having the, the vision and the goals and agree with all of that wholeheartedly but at the start it is tough and it is it is oh, tedious yeah. because it's just you and you're going from technician to, to business owner making that transition you don't know what you don't know so i think being comfortable with with those late nights and, and being okay that you know there will be light at the end of the tunnel when you, when you yeah, do there's a journey that towards down. that ideal tuesday right it's not about having it straight away starting up a business it's going through the process of getting to that ideal Tuesday. Yep, absolutely. And the thing is like a lot of us race pretty hard. Mm. Say like a, a tradie, a plumber makes really good money, 
you you all of a sudden you're making a few hundred grand a year, which is very achievable for a business owner who is a plumber who knows what they're doing. Um, you can easily, not easily, but you can get to that five hundred thousand dollars a year, six hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, but it's not going to be easy. But if you have the right plan and the right strategy in place, it's great. A lot of people get to the point of burnout though, and they just come collapse. Yeah, they just collapse and they come crumbling back down. And so what we're trying to do here is set your mind towards what would be success and how do you know if you're going to get there. And this is a really simple, we've actually got an activity for this in the, the program, but um, check it out if you are part of the, the, the accelerator. So maybe we'll jump to Jordan, maybe one of yours. Yeah, cool. Systems. And this is something that can be done at the start, especially when you're in there doing the actual work, the day-to-day, um, whatever it may be, if you're doing... If you're a tradesman and you're out there quoting jobs, doing jobs, if it's photography, whatever the case may be, think of it from the start of the customer journey. So when you're finished doing the job along that whole way, you can start to document processes and have things in place. So when it's not you, you can say, this is the guide to how we do things here. And an example of that could be something as simple as a customer review. So once you finish the job, you've sent your invoice and that's been paid. You can set up an, an automatic email to prompt a Google review. Mm -hmm. to try and build that online Mm -hmm. presence and credibility. So this can be done throughout the whole business, client onboarding, sending out invoices, doing uh, proposals or doing quotes. Just think systems and processes because at the start, yes, it's going to be slower for you to write them out and you'll just think, oh, just do it by myself. It's easier for me to just do it by myself. But think of you down the track where there's two or three people. You can bring in an admin person or bring in a technician to go and do the work. You want to have all of that streamlined so then you can scale. I love that. It reminds me of that saying, slower today, faster forever. Yeah. Yeah. Really like it. DG? Yeah. You know, probably building off Jordan's topic there, systems, it's especially early on for a business, it's so important to build a foundation. So to actually, what is your business? How does it work? Because we don't want a business where it's solely reliant on the owner coming in that day, dictating and telling people what to do more or less. So the business is completely and solely reliant on one person. Mm. It's so important, especially early on when you do have time, because guess what? You're not going to be at full capacity from day one. This is the time to be process driven. Like what Jordan said, implement your system straight away and they're not going to be correct. And that's okay because every single business I've worked with, doesn't matter how big they are, are constantly refining. Mm. It's a constant improvement, whether it's an automation in a certain area, whether it's, hiring outside and getting a VA to handle some of the low value tasks rather than someone in Australia, whether it's implementing additional staff, whether it's even if it's sales. So it's building it out and knowing where to grow next, not just coming to work today and going through your daily tasks and it is what it is. Mm. What happens today is great. What happens tomorrow is great. But understand your business, build the foundation and continue to refine it. I like it. And that was going to lead to another point of mine, which is, a lot of business owners struggle with analysis paralysis, just a basic idea of there are so many choices to make. There are so many systems to set up. There are so many pieces of software you want to acquire and use and you just become overwhelmed. Whether you've, you're you worried about MailChimp, Active Campaign, Drip, Salesforce, like you're thinking all these things seem to do the same thing. Which one do I choose? A big part of the, the literature says that just starting something gives you the confidence. Like a lot of people say that they'll be you know, happy when or they'll be confident when they reach a certain point. But the reality is you get confidence from doing in business. You, Of course, you don't want to do something that completely breaks your, your entire business, but do something, make a decision and move forward. Um, and this is the trail on point from yours, Daniel, which is that you get to that MVP, that minimum viable product as soon as you can, because then you'll figure it out. You'll get customer feedback, you'll have your own feedback and so on and so forth. Like a good example of this is with us building the coaching program. We didn't know whether we wanted to go to a fully fledged, like kind of like custom built WordPress system that would handle all of the courses, all of the videos, all of that sort of stuff. Or if we wanted to just use something off the shelf like Kajabi. We ended up going with Kajabi because it was the easiest thing for us to get off the ground, stand up and start moving. Uh, And that is something that we can change in time. Yes, Yes, it'll be painful if we go to change, but we probably will if we can get a thousand business owners in or two thousand. But there's no point in us committing tens of thousands of dollars to build a custom system if we don't know. So the easiest choice was to just get started. What is the way that we can get started and build confidence in the actual business idea? For sure. George, what do you got for us? Um, so having a plan 
all sort of rolling into one. Um, and what we'll see here is a lot of it sort of builds on the previous point or bounces around a little bit. So having a plan and what does that look like? F for us, we follow some of the stuff Gino Wickman talks about interaction, having that one page plan, or he calls it a VTO. Mm -hmm. I think whatever method you follow, whether it's Gino or Vern Harnish in scaling up, you need to have some type of plan in place. So you know where you're going. So you know that there's an, an end point. I shouldn't say end point because it's forever evolving. Yep. But for the next 12 months, you know what, what you want to achieve and how, how to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And then you can break that down further and further. So I think having so having a, a goal in mind and putting it pen on paper, writing them down. So that way you can break that down even further and have actionable tasks is super important. And having values, it's, it's a fluffy thing they always, they, universities always spoke about where mm. we're speaking, uh, doing marketing subjects and whatnot. And now being a business owner, I'm like, that actually makes sense. Because when you want to build a brand and build a business, you want to make sure that that it holds true to you and who you are as a person. So I think it's really important to tie your values into your strategy. And that's something that we've started to do at Grayspace. And I know we all we all have the same values um, for the Accelerator program as well. So tying that stuff in as well to, to help with the why and to remind you why you're doing things and not to get sidetracked with something else that can come up, I think is super important to, to, to keep you in line and on track to achieve what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. I think one of the issues that, because obviously we obviously recommend traction. We have multiple times on the podcast. I think one of the feedback I was getting, oh, it doesn't really relate to me. It doesn't, oh, I don't know how to do it. It's okay to slightly adjust frameworks and templates that are slightly more suitable to you. So let's say, for example, in traction, part of the VTO is to set like a 10-year goal. If mm. for you that just seems too far and yeah, I didn't do that. unthinkable. We scrapped it too. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Scrap it or just slightly adjust it to five. Make it personalized to you use the framework but adjust it to yourself and don't use it as an excuse not action because your reasoning is it doesn't suit me it's not for me mm -hmm. it's okay to adjust these things having that plan like jordan said it's more important than executing someone else's well this actually leads on to a point that i was going to make about a fixed versus abundance mindset or a growth mindset and this for those folks that don't know it's just about abundance mindset or growth mindset it's just effectively about knowing that you can achieve a goal if you are motivated to achieve it is effectively what it is. You've probably come across fixed mindset people because, and it's perfectly reasonable. They're the types of people that probably don't like change, probably don't want to grow, don't listen to podcasts, don't read books. That's okay, right? That's fine. That might not be you, but that's them. And some of those people have a wonderful position in your business because you know what you're going to get from them. Whereas the growth mindset person might be the person that's seeing the opportunity to work for you to then grow in their own way. So there's, there's good and bad. But one of the things I wanted to say here is typically if you have a growth mindset, you're willing to take risks often, but they're calculated risks. And the key thing I want to double click on here is calculated. You've done the work. You understand the risk reward benefit of running a business. Uh, I'll give you a good example is let's say your business is already in motion. You've got that inertia. You don't want to break it. You think, okay, finally, I might be making some headway. But you know in the back of your mind that you do need to transition some of your business away from a system a software, a platform or whatever, that can be really painful. So a good example of this is like you run a business and it's traditionally run on paper or on a spreadsheet. You know that there's a better solution out there, whether it's like monday.com, HubSpot, Salesforce, some other system, you know, it's going to be hard and you don't, you're not a tech person, quote unquote, which in this day and age is a, a bit of a fixed mindset. Anyone can really do it. If you've got an iPhone in your pocket, you can use some of these tools. Um, and so you think, okay, well, maybe how do I do this in a calculated way? Maybe the way you do that is you run the two pieces of software in parallel. So you have your existing Excel spreadsheet. And then slowly over time, every customer that's added from here on out is added to HubSpot or added to XYZ. I see a lot of business owners trying to do all or nothing really quickly. Uh, a growth mindset person would want to take on the challenge, but also know the risks. The risks of doing that are pretty severe if you get it wrong. So just go with it one thing, one approach at a time. And I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example of this uh, a company called WiseTech, which I think is Australia's best software acquiring company. That's on the ASX, by the way. Uh, it is a logistics software company. And what they do to grow overseas is they don't uh, just build software willy-nilly. They actually buy other companies. And what they do is they run that new company's software in parallel with their existing software for sometimes years at a time, learning the systems, understanding how it works, and then migrating across. And so this is an idea of how you have a fix versus a you know, growth mindset in practice while also 
not betting the house on something. Mm. DG, what do you got for us, man? Um, this probably goes down what we do on a day-to-day basis and that's sort of understand your numbers a bit more. So go delve in a little bit because we get a lot of people that come in saying, oh, you know, tell me what my numbers are like. So, okay, cool. We can run through your P&L, your balance sheet. Mm. But that's not the nitty gritty is the deep of it. Like you need to be focusing, setting targets, understanding what your gross profits are, what falls into a direct cost, what falls into an operating cost. Are you factoring in operating costs into your pricing? So there's a lot more to it than seeing a profit and a loss because whether you like it, a profit and loss won't tell you product profitability a lot of the times. It tells you profitability for a period of time, right? So we're only seeing call it a month or a quarter, an equal quarter or an equal month, what happens over a period of time. How we get to that answer, business owners need to know. So going through pricing strategies, going through pricing, understanding how you're forming your pricing model. Are you following a recommended retail price of competitors and then working backwards to get the best cost, call it possible, to create your margins? Or are you a service-based business providing value? Are you able to price slightly differently? Can you um, create better margins in different areas? So I think really understanding where your costs, your revenue, your growth is coming from is super important. Mm. I like that. It's like knowing the difference between operational and financial metrics. Mm. I know you're going to do a loom with folks on that in the course, but um, just knowing the two is really, really important. Like for example, with the podcast, we know how many people download the show. We know how many unique listeners there are. If we were to run a profit and loss in this business, it would be inherently linked to all of those metrics, Mm -hmm. right? Which makes a lot of sense, but a lot of people don't go that next step or even know how those two things impact each other. For sure. And that would, that would be relevant to any business, regardless Mm -hmm. of what you do. If you're able to identify that and then tie them in, that's fantastic because you'll see that they do work hand in hand together. Mm. Yeah, Super well, important. Well, say for example, it'd be very simple to do a, a PL for this podcast because the number of listeners probably means X number of dollars, you know, per listener, per list, download, whatever. Very simple to do. But yeah, you may have a thousand products in your business and you might have different products at different times or you might have weekend rates if you're in hospitality. Still, you can still do that, right? You can still crunch those numbers. You can still figure out the, what we call unit economics. As well, you it's more through. important to do it in that scenario because Absolutely. you need to know what products, what service lines, and what departments of your business are performing and what are not performing. A profit and loss sometimes can't tell you mm. because we just look at once, let's say, for example, service line gross sales and then direct cost wages. We don't actually know what department or product it comes from. So unless you've got a great bookkeeper or, or systems and automations in place that can actually start splitting these up so you can track them on a time basis or some type of spreadsheet linked to a number of sales, what product is being sold, what the estimated cost of sales is, estimated operations that's being applied to that and what a rough net profit is, then you're not going to know what department is you know, doing well. And if a department, let's say, for example, is literally covering the costs of all the bad departments. Yeah, it's like the old cafe analogy. Like so much so much money is made on coffee, mm. but so much is lost on food a lot of the times. Um, and so if you – that's why a lot of those really successful small pop-up coffee shops work really well. They have small footprints or smaller leases. Uh, you get those big restaurants that often close down pretty often because there's so – the economics at scale just don't work. Um, well, they do work in some instances, but not always. Uh, I might quickly jump back to one, which is Buyverse Build. Just cut, tuck this in here. A lot of people think you can just jump onto realcommercial.com.au or whatever it is, look for a business, connect with a broker, sign the NDA, get the financials, pay the money, done. That's not how business works. If only it was that easy. Yeah. Um, sure that you might find a, a nugget of gold after sifting through that for a few years, um, but it is hard to do that. So it's logical that you would want to buy a business versus build one. We've got some more comments on this, but the reality is you've got to do your due diligence. You've got to get an expert on your side, particularly an accountant in this case that can look through the numbers and understand that. A contract of sale is where your lawyer comes in. They will be the ones who are in the finer details deciding what is in and what is out of the contract as in what are you buying and what are you not buying? You might be buying the stock. You might not be buying the stock. You might be buying the coffee machine. A coffee machine might be leased. So you just don't know until you actually get someone on your side to ask those questions. You can find most commercial lawyers will help you or at least point you in the right direction. A good accountant will, of course, help you and charge you appropriately, but get them on your side. DG? 
Yeah, sort of building off your sort of buying, call it, call it proposition. My example is sort of buying almost like a client base or a database, right? Very, very common you see it in the professional services game as they start to scale, right? So whether it's lending, financial planning, accounting, it's that these firms go up for sale and these clients mm. that are ongoing clients, repeat clients, so you can average out a book. You can almost absorb them as a business, right? So take over the business, apply your branding, your business, apply your models and foundations. Because if you buy an older firm, let's say, for example, that's stuck on old systems, uses, let's say, for example, only Australian staff, so their wage percentages are way too high, implementing a system like yourself and you've done all the work pre-planning, all of a sudden you've probably purchased the business at a discounted rate compared mm. to what you can create that business if you were to apply your business models and you can scale from that component. So I think really, really common in the professional services games and that's a really, really fast way to to grow rather than buying completely new business, buy bolt-ons to yours. Mm. Mm. We get a lot of questions coming through the podcast and by the way, keep, coming, keep them coming, mm. um, that talk about that, right? Like, People just think you have to buy the business. Like if you see the shop in the street, you have to buy the entire shop. You don't. You could buy the website. You could buy the stock. You could hire the people if they're closing down. You could. There are so many other ways to cut it. And we've talked about this on the show before. Um, and you guys, um, you gave me your proper tick of approval for buying a podcast, the other podcast, the Australian mm -hmm. Property Podcast. So last year executed that agreement. And we didn't buy anything other than the name. Um, and that was oh, yeah. it. Yeah, that was yeah. over lunch. I do remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah in Melbourne. <laughs> Super yeah. casual, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that's uh, proper advice, isn't it? Yeah, 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 for sure. But even if, sorry, Owen, before we move on, like that whole ver uh, horizontal, sorry, horizontal integration piece that can happen in any business. Mm. It can be it can be product based business, service based business. It doesn't matter what it is. You can always add to your brand. And then if you go a step further and you look at vertical integration, so how can you sort of start to acquire the supply chain? I guess it's yeah. as you get bigger and bigger. But it's the same thing with um, I think it was Standard Oil in the US. How they got to the point where they realized, okay, well, the transport company is making X amount, so why don't we just buy them? And they were a monopoly on the whole thing end to end, end to end of I guess the oil dig up and then service delivery that they got broken up. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure it's standard oil, but I'm I sure. I think that that sounds familiar. But it's like um, I remember. Do you remember we had Joe from Rumble Coffee Roasters yeah. on the show earlier on? We did a walkthrough of Joe's uh, coffee roastery and the team down at Rumble Coffee, great coffee beans in Melbourne, by the way. Um, they ship everywhere. Um, we talked about how the roasters make their money basically and how that money passes back to the farmers. This is an example of what Jordan's talking about, about vertical integration. You're in that industry, you're going up and down from the beans getting grown somewhere overseas to getting put into your mouth in the shape of a coffee. Um, there's a whole supply chain there. Vert a horizontal integration could be a similar thing, but in, a, in an adjacent industry, or maybe there's a product or something that you can pull into your ecosystem. And that's just about being aware of what's going on around you. Yeah, yeah. It was standard. I've just fact-checked myself. Fact-checked. <laughs> Stan <laughs> Can I get a fact-check? It, it, um, <laughs> it is standard oil. And I do recommend reading the story because it's super interesting. The US government actually broke them up because mm. of that, because they formed a monopoly. Um, <laughs> they broke them up because they had complete control of the whole thing. So Yeah, well, that's interesting. It's like um, – like any of the service stations right here in Australia, basically, yeah. like you got like BP, they also sell the fuel, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah, they refine it, but they sell it. Um, another one that you've taught me, which I might just, I'll throw it to you in just a second. Yeah, go for it. Is having a sales script. Yep. I think that's something that's new to me. Can you talk us through that? For me, the sales script, it's good to keep everything uniform and have the same type of conversation with people. So it started... I do most of the sales stuff for Gray Space where I'll take the calls and we'll run through the pain points and whatnot. But if I wasn't here and let's say Dan was to do it, it'd be completely different. Or if both of us weren't here for whatever reason, then it's not something you can just step in and do. So having a script keeps everything uniform. So as you scale, as your team scales, once you have a sales team, or even if it's not a sales team and it's just you, you want to be able to have a repeatable script for every customer that you go and visit and every job that you do. So I think it just allows you to be a bit more uniform and present a bit more professionally um, and allows you to improve as you're doing it. We started using a tool called Fireflies AI, which records 
the conversations and automatically summarizes them. And I go back and listen to those calls sometimes too. So it's the same thing with the podcasting when we started and even now you go back and you listen so you can improve. Like, okay, I said, um, too many times. I know when we started podcasting, the first one I listened to, it's like, I, I kept saying, oh, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? And I heard it and I hear it now and I'm like, oh, I hate that phrase. So being able to go back and listen to your sales calls and then adjust your script to see what works is super valuable because if you can increase your close rates by 5%, across a year that could be huge that could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars so it's really important to put a conscious effort into building that script and making sure that you're on top of it all the time talking about listening to your own voice don't like that i got me i just don't like listening to my own voice i hate it but it's so important especially early days <laughs> so important yeah. it is yeah you go back and listen to the first couple and it's like oh it's the grumpiest car ride of my life honestly <laughs> listening to myself talk yeah <laughs> no, well like, for what it's worth man i think you do it well oh, thanks mate um so yeah i mean and having that sales script is also where it forms part of the funnel anyone that's uh, a pioneer is already in the accelerator or has uh subscribed or whatever or just spoken to jordan uh whether it's through gray space or through the accelerator you will know how he speaks on the phone and i think that is so valuable for what we're building and you like that repeatability as you mentioned yeah i think it, it also comes from when i was at uni i worked in a call center for oh did you a it's, year and a we, half we discovered today that jordan also was doing a tra or starting a trade or something like yeah this. yeah yeah, yeah. I, man uh, of many talents i am what, what do they say? Many talents, master, master of few. <laughs> <laughs> something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. We'll just um, go specialist general. Yes, or something, yeah, like something like that. <laughs> just rewriting the the book. Um, and yeah, we worked. Uh, we I worked in a call center through uni, and there was. That's when I got introduced to scripting and how to handle objections. So, again, it's just doing hundreds of calls and mm. building that confidence because at the start, if you haven't done sales before, it's it's not easy to mm. have objections and someone say get you can get yelled at you can get sworn at not in our sales calls back then at the call center <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> completely different um but having that repeatability to then pivot uh, if if something didn't work like when we were at the call center they would have people listening to our calls and then there would be a meeting on how to adjust scripts and how you should mm. interpret what this person said or what why they've objected so it's really important to listen to your calls and well, even if it's not calls, it can be, I'm just trying to think of another example besides sales where you can consciously improve. Maybe it's a customer conversation when you're asking for a review or even an upsell. That's probably a good point that other businesses, well, most service-based businesses can do. It's upsell. Okay, if you have a, a plumbing company and you go there to fix a, a basin or a, a tap, it's like, oh, do you want me to walk through the house and maybe we can see it? If there's any other issues that we can fix while we're here, something as simple as that, where the client's going to go, yeah, for sure. We've had, you know what, now that you remind me, the tap upstairs has been dripping or there's a bit of dampness in the roof, whatever it may be. If you're a service-based business, you want to be able to have those pre-planned conversation starters, whether it's a conversation starter or a script, mm -hmm. so you can you can maximize your sale value as well. But working at the um, call center, just while we're on it, is a miserable place. <laughs> I don't recommend it. It, it really, like, literally. Were you, you preying on elderly women? Uh, no, who, no, 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 because you know what? And I always used to ask that question. Oh, you're a scumbag for what you're doing. I said, and what we were told to say is, would you do this for eight hours a day? Every 30 seconds, you're getting a new call. Would you sit here and do that for nothing? And then every time they'd be stumped. But it was just a odd place to work some interesting characters you literally every as soon as a call would hang up new one comes up it was painful but it taught me resilience <laughs> <laughs> it's all learning growth yeah. mindset it's, it's coming handy now yeah. right yeah, yeah from handling our calls from handling gray space calls it's coming very handy so yeah. thank you yeah. for yeah. your pain <laughs> yeah just on that i think it, it also taught a lot of resilience and like to have difficult conversations and I think in business, that is so important to be able to cop a bit of criticism because we're not all perfect all the time and we make mistakes. So being able to take as much emotion out of that type of conversation as possible mm. is great. Oh, the whole thing is like um, 
what's the whole man in the ring thing? You yeah. know, that whole, or I should say person in the ring uh, is you've got to put yourself out there as a business owner. If you don't have a thick skin, it's probably going to be pretty difficult because you, you're you going to get judged. Yeah. Whether it's at your profit and loss, your sales, or whether it's from your team or whether it's from your customer, someone's going to judge you and they won't always agree with what you're doing. 100%. And yeah. just on that note as well, and to use that fighting, if you want to call it fighting or boxing analogy, like if you're a professional athlete and you're, a, say you're a boxer, right? You have a nutritionist, you have a chef, trainer, you've got all of these support staff, whether that can be translated to marketing, your accountant and whoever it may be, they're all there for you and you can call them. But when the time comes and you need to perform, it's just you in that ring. Mm. It's There's no one else. So you need to be able to self-motivate and and step up. No matter who the support group is, if you, if you don't want to achieve something, then you're not going to achieve it. Mm. it. It is on you. And I think a lot of people look to lean on others and that is fantastic. But at the end of the day, it stops with you. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Yeah. Motivational talk. Motivational Wednesdays. <laughs> Daniel, um, one of the things you spoke about recently uh, and we spoke about behind the scenes is the idea of organizational charts. Yes. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so I think it's really – so one of the key pain points that we see is that business owners always complain about staff. There's not enough staff. My staff aren't doing enough. They're doing the wrong thing. They don't understand what's going on. I don't know what to do next. And it's a very, very big problem for a lot of small businesses. I actually think the problem starts from the beginning where you don't actually know what you're building out. Mm. And that's where an organizational chart comes in is you want to be able to put it on paper, on a board, on some type of spreadsheet, whatever it be, but you want to physically draw out a chart of where everyone sits, almost like a hierarchy within your business. And you may not have the staffing to do that straight away. It might only be two or three people. If that's the case, I want you to draw out your ideal organizational chart if you were to 10x, 2x, 3x, whatever turnover you're at, and do your current staff fit a profile for that business. Because if they don't, they're probably the wrong people. Mm. So it's identifying who you need. Building off Jordan's probably boxing um, analogy just before is that support staff is crucial to you performing at your very best. So you need to make sure that everyone around you is there to help the business perform, not just you. So drawing this out will help you identify what's my next hire. If I was to bring on another $500,000 worth of work, mm. how is it going to – I can't handle it all. Mm. So how can sales, we handle it? Salesperson. How do we handle it? Yeah. So who do we go for next? And I think people just hire for the sake of hire sometimes. They go, I'm busy. I'm just going to hire you know, Steve's cousin's mate because I know he's doing the same thing as me. Mm. And that might be the completely wrong person. Um and beyond that, like going into a bit of a team, I know we'll talk about it very deeply in the course, but I think business owners need to provide the resources for their employees to succeed. Their employees need to know what a successful, what, what it means to be successful in that role, right? Because the business owners are going, oh, just come in and go do that. The employee doesn't actually know what they're trying to achieve, what the result is, what where they're going. So I think creating your seats putting the right people into it and giving them the resources to actually do well in it is where sort of that plays into. Mm. For sure. I think it also to follow on from that, if you are a one person band and it is just you, you can still apply what Daniel's talking about. It may not be in the form of actually hiring people, but dedicating time to do certain things. That's what we did at the start. When we started our business, we had we, we were doing everything. But we would dedicate certain hours to do certain things. If someone was to say, oh, I, I, that's not me. I'm, it's too early for me. Oh, it's not me. No, that's not the case. Mm. You can time block for marketing. You can time block for sales, operations, to doing the actual work. So this applies to you regardless of what stage of the business you're in. If it's just you or if you've got 30 people, it doesn't matter. You can still make it work for you and your scenario. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And doubling down on that, what it will do, it will help you identify what areas are taking up most of your time and where you need help the most. If you're struggling in, for example, marketing, well, maybe it's time to maybe outsource some marketing and get some help in, whether it's probably not agency, but someone to, to give you a little bit of a hand in that department. It might not even be staff to begin with, or if it's just admin, maybe it's time to get a VA. But on Jordan's point, it will help you identify where your pain points are. 
So you mentioned agencies, Daniel. Um, one of the things that we've found early on in the coaching and accelerator program is a lot of business owners are just struggling with particularly marketing, but all types of agencies that they work with, whether it's on the tech side, like digital ads, uh, whether it's for website stuff, outsourcing a lot of that kind of like output or the importance of their business to an agency. And what we find is that people don't even understand what the ROI is, the return on investment. Like what do you get for spending $5,000 a month? But once you peel the layer back a bit, you also don't know how much of that $5,000 is actually going towards the thing that you're paying them for. So a good example that we're seeing uh, recently, it's not a good example, but it's illustrative of the point, which is that someone may be on a commitment to spend $5,000 with a marketing agency that's including ads or SEO or whatever, but only about two or $3,000 of that is actually going to the actual ads. The other two or $3,000 is staying with the agency. And so you've got to really calculate, well, hang on a second. If I was able to do this or if I learned the systems or if I insourced this or if I did something in a different way or approached another place, could I spend $1,000 on managing that and get $4,000 of the budget going towards the ads? And that's definitely an opportunity for us as coaches and inside the accelerated community to coach people on how to do that, to coach people on how to set up Facebook ads, Google ads, these types of things. But you can learn how to do it. There are courses online. There are resources that are available. And that's if you're spending repeatedly, seriously consider how much of that you can do yourself and how much you do need someone to set it up for you probably, but ongoing basis, how much of it do you actually need? Yeah, for sure. I think a really important point on that as well is to have a basic understanding of whatever you're engaging the person to do, or whether it's SEO, yeah. Facebook ads, you want to be able to have conversations with the agency or whoever you're using. You want to be able to interpret the data and the metrics that you mentioned as well, because a lot of the time it's just in the too hard basket. I, I pay them, they'll take care of it. You can't have that mindset. You need to be able to know, have a basic understanding of what SEO is or what Facebook ads are, average client value. If you're getting a hundred leads and it's costing you a hundred dollars a lead and you're selling your product for 80 bucks, well, that's a problem. Yeah, it looks good on paper, yeah, but you're not customers. seeing the other side. Yeah. 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 So it's super important to, to know the metrics that apply in your industry and your business to make sure you're not taken advantage of. People are taken advantage of in that industry. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to blanket it because it's just not, it's not the case, but there have been instances that I've seen where people are taken advantage of and it's just not right. Mm. It's that example where you're paying $10,000, the agency's getting eight and there's only 2,000 going to the actual spend or whatever it may be. It just doesn't sit right with me. Like we've said from the start, we want to deliver value and, and make sure that everything is ethical, ethical because sometimes it's not, which is unfortunate. Yeah. And sometimes people pay the price. And like you said, it's about having that base level of knowledge at least, to have the intelligent conversation. Yeah. yeah. And Daniel, I know you want to talk about this too because ultimately responsibility lies with the business owner. Like you're the one that pays the bills. So there are many ways that people try and outsource things, but it, it does come back to that. Absolutely. I think understanding the outcomes as well. So know what they're doing, like Jordan said, but understand what the outcome needs to be. Like you're obviously employing this – agency person or employee, whoever it is there to help you, you need to know what the outcome needs to be because you're going to incur X expenditure. There needs to be a Y result from it. Mm. Unless you know what that is, how can you track performance? Mm. You can't, mm. whether it's outsourced, whether it's agency, whether it's staffing. There's no way to track it unless you know what the result needs to be or the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. One of the big areas that people – want us to help them with and one of the areas of opportunity that we definitely see people actually write into us and say i want to explore the idea of offshoring can you talk us through that yeah Dan? absolutely so outsourcing we do it i know you do it as well and it's becoming very very popular and common mm. amongst businesses um and essentially it's employing someone overseas to handle certain tasks, responsibilities, or roles within your business, right? I think we were maybe subject to it a little bit, but almost that myth that, you know, there's going to be an issue with the quality of work, there's a language barrier, there's um, timing barriers. I'm very confident to say it's a complete myth. Yeah. Yep. I think the only people that think that, that are, are the people that have never really tried it. Yeah. Um, because outsourcing has been one of the best things we've done as a business, you know, some of our best staff are outsourced. Um, skill set is unbelievable. Communication is great. Always work online. Work ethic is second to none. You can't even get someone like this 
mm. sort of in Australia that we've noticed anyway. So being able to sort of, again, I think it flows down to that organizational chart again to sort of understand what you're trying to outsource, why you're outsourcing it, what the outcome needs to be, and then finding someone that fits that role. Mm. That's where it's important. And you can use companies as well. We use a, an Australian-based company that sources, gives us the interviews, we interview, they set up the physical space, they set up all the hardware, the IT, um, the HR department's all done through them and you pay a management fee to that entity. So that's probably like an easy way to do it. Um, but I'm pretty sure you do it the other way where you found the staff member and helped them set up, right? Yeah. Yeah, I went through a company called WorkPod. That's mm. W-R-K pod. Uh, and they're great uh, and they help you find the staff member, but then you have a direct contract with that person in the end, which is the way I preferred to do it. Um, in that instance, if it was a whole team, maybe that starts to get uh, in, introduce a few more complexities. But uh, absolutely, like offshoring, I couldn't agree more with you there. The, the there are two elements to offshoring. One is you're growing and you're system systematizing your business. But the other side is it does uh, allow you to flourish because you're minimizing costs where costs can be minimized, which allows you to reinvest for more growth. So you're getting both sides of the ledger. But clearly one of the areas where people try and do both of those things is through automation. So it fulfills a similar task. And George, you're the man for this. Sure. So tell us a bit. Just before I jump in on the to, to follow up on that outsourcing side of things, it builds on the processes that we're speaking about because it, it is the buzzword at the moment, the automation and the outsourcing. But if you don't have your processes beforehand, yeah. you can't just jump in and hire someone and then go, okay, do something. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Org chart, like Daniel said, processes, it all builds on itself. Yeah, just having Notion and, yeah. or a Google Doc or whatever, just some instructions for them to follow. 100%. And in terms of automation, again, that is the buzzword, that and AI, I should say. Um, Automating as much as possible and from the start. So have your processes in place. If it's email marketing, what does that look like? How do you automate your email marketing? You can set up sequences. So once they sign onto your email list, they receive an email after two days and then after four days, and then they're prompted to purchase something. That's an example of how you can automate your email marketing. For us as accountants, we have quarterly BASs that we prepare for clients. So every three months, we know we need to prepare a BAS. We because we have multiple clients now, we have a software that automatically lets us know, like it pre-populates, it's like a- it does, Yeah, it does. It, it creates a repeating work item as soon as a certain date passes. And we have hundreds of work items that are populated at a certain date, mm -hmm. let's say the new batch is time to do. Another way to for automation, something that I'm working, we're, we're both working on at the moment is using Slack and how to integrate Slack throughout the business. Slack is a tool you can use to talk to each other, but it's got heaps of integrations. And one of the pain points that we were having from an operational perspective is that we all these great ideas and do all these things, but we'd lose track of all these ideas that we'd come up with. So now we're implementing a system where once something is moved in Notion and marked as complete by an admin staff or an accountant, we're notified in Slack. So that process is now automated. Something mm -hmm. as simple as following someone up, that's now automated. So you can you can think of an automation for anything. I think the easiest way for anyone to do it, any business owner to start an automation process is to, to whiteboard it, or whether it's a whiteboard piece of paper, draw out the process first, and then go and build it out through Zapier if that's the integration you want to use. So Zapier is something that connects two pieces of software that don't traditionally talk to each other. It allows them to talk to each other. Mm. It is limited with some apps, but it does have some really good functionality with the bigger uh, pieces of software. And, and I know you don't need to be a coder. Exactly. You, know, you can just, yeah, there's no APIs. There's no things like that. It's literally just log into the software and then connect them. And it yes. doesn't just have to be for, you know, customer related things as well. Like internal tasks become really good for us. It was the onboarding that was very time consuming. We take yep. on a new client, a new client and the onboarding process was taking too long. And especially when we've broken the business down to segments, Jordan was doing sales and I'm handling operations and service del delivery. It was super important to make sure that what Jordan was going through was relayed correctly we knew when what was signed what engagement being taken on what service needs to be delivered and that information comes to me promptly accurately sort of using ignition our software sales then using zapier into slack has mm. completely automated everything we do i know as soon as an engagement is signed it comes through my slack notification we're good to go admin knows exactly to start onboarding prompts emails we're still even working to refine that process even more cool. the whole time 
But even that, it's a completely internal customer, has no idea what's happening in the background and has been a really, really useful tool to save a lot of time, especially over the last sort of six months. Yeah, Amazing. I, I don't think there's a business out there that can say, oh, we can't do that. We can't automate parts of it because it's just not true. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, given software and how easy it is to do it, like Zapier, I have no idea how to code or do anything like that. It is the best, like it, it actually blew my mind the first time I discovered it, the amount of the zaps, so I guess the amount of integrations you can have in one work item. And we, we'll, we'll dive deep in, in the course with that, but it's just unbelievable. So many different pieces of software mm -hmm. talking to each other and are pushing information at different points in time. It's, it's nuts. Yeah, like things you probably don't expect, like someone's on Facebook added to your group and then they are all of a sudden in your email management software. Yeah. You know, like that's the kind of stuff where you're just like, I didn't think Facebook could connect to like MailChimp or something like that, but it, it, absolutely it can. Um, and that's where uh, I might bring in a piece, which is just about email marketing. We talk about this a lot, but the easiest way to grow your existing business profitably is to use your existing business. What do I mean by that is? What do I mean by that? It means using the people who are already doing business with you to grow your business. So retargeting people on your mailing list, people that are already paying customers and you can upsell, cross sell, et cetera. Uh, and it's still surprising to me these days how few businesses actually segment their audience. So that would be um, when you when you go into uh, your ma email management software, I'll use MailChimp because it's the biggest example. We don't use it anymore, but um, most people still are familiar with this. Even in MailChimp, you can go in and do things like tagging or categorizing or segmenting your audience. And that just means like effectively saying, Jordan bought a pair of Nike shoes. Daniel bought Adidas. Therefore, send Nike deals to Jordan. Uh, don't send them to, to Daniel. It's really that simple and it can be used for anything. Um, and you can have integrations, for example, from Pulse at point of sale up into your email marketing solution or from your e-commerce store or from Service Mate if you're a trader or a service-based business or landscape or something like that. You can do all of that simply, easily. You don't have to automate it. We do. And you'll experience that if you ever go through the sales funnel, but um, got to use it. It's so high value yeah. to, to target people. And that way. The, good, the good thing about email marketing is it doesn't need to have an industry specific software like ServiceMate. You can yeah. that can link straight into Zero through Zapier. Yeah. Where if you create an invoice in Zero, it'll automatically create a customer. I think yeah. they're called customers yep. in, in um, Active Campaign or Mailchimp in your example. So again, it's something that everyone should be doing because it does have the best ROI. Yeah, absolutely. And that's interesting that you would say that because normally people would say that accounting is the end point, but in this case, you've used the end point, which is accounting to then spring back into the front end, exactly. which is marketing, um, which basically any, as long as you can get two pieces of software connected, you can create this kind of what Salesforce might call a 360 degree view. Yeah. And you can connect everything around the customer, which is absolutely wonderful. One of the things that we might've skipped over, Daniel, is this idea of do not overspend, mm. not spending too much. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, as the business starts to grow, so do the profits in theory, right, for a lot of people. But yep. it doesn't – you don't want to be sort of capping yourself as well. Like you want to continue that growth and you want to continue that growth at scale. Taking $5,000 a week, for example, is not a reasonable way to continue doing that. Growth needs capital, mm. right? We need to retain money to be able to spend it back onto the business, whether it's an uh, ad campaign that's going to cost a little bit more than usual and you want to be able to – have some money put aside mm. to go down that path. It might be a piece of expensive equipment that you need to all of a sudden potentially create a whole new department or create an automation that wasn't there before. So for example, like a joiner would be like a CNC machine. So rather than a tradesman having to cut a sheet of board for a cabinet, it's literally processed through a system and the machine spits it out. Yep. So you're creating a whole new efficiency within your business, but you know they're two, three hundred thousand dollars a pop. You can't get one straight away a lot of the time, so you've got to build towards it. And the only way to do that is to start retaining money, retaining profits, or you know, go through finance facilities. But equity is always generally the the best way to go ahead about it, especially if you don't want to start you know racking up liabilities. Mm. But you know, a jet ski won't help you. But having you know five thousand dollars in the business extra to reinvest back in definitely will. Mm. Mm. How cool are CNC machines though? For those of you yeah. who don't know, they're just incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah, how they can just cut things out like within a millimeter. You're just like, wow. And different materials, different widths, lengths. You tell her what you want and it just spits it out. <laughs> it's just, oh, 
it's incredible just going from the software to an actual product in in your hands um okay so i've got some books uh brought some books up from melbourne Jordan's introduced me to just about all of these. But, um, <laughs> uh, we've got Traction on the shelf here. Traction's a great book for learning about uh, basically everything in a business. But one of the things I took away is not just the the vision and, and executing that, but also just getting the right people in the right seats, as Jenna Wickman would say. Oh, we've got Scaling Up over there, which is more textbook-like. It's, uh, it's still incredible in terms of the systems. There's a lot of one-pages that you can rip out of that guy. Um, I've got... I did bring. I didn't bring this up last time I came to Sydney, so I wanted to bring it this time, which is just digital marketing for dummies. Uh, it's just a book, or maybe I did bring it up last yeah, time. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Sure. Uh, digital marketing for dummies. It, it it sounds simple, and it is, but it covers the basics of marketing your business. Gives you steps on how to connect apps and use email and that sort of stuff. Uh, and there was one other I wanted to cover with you. Oh, the E Myth. E Myth is a wonderful book, um, just for learning about the processes and systems, particularly for really small businesses. Like if you're a sole trader, if you're a business with just a couple of employees, that's the book you want to pick up, that and traction first. Um, now, obviously, we've tried to incorporate as many of those principles into uh, the course and into the accelerator in our own words, but all four of those books, traction, scaling up, marketing, digital marketing for dummies and E-Myth Revisited, fantastic books. Jordan, one of the things um, that I learned from, partially learned from marketing for dummies uh, was how to build a customer profile. Yep, for sure. It's interesting because I was going to talk about, um, a bit different to this, but Blue Ocean Strategy and the oh, story Blue Ocean Strategy, yeah. The story in there about how, well, what Cirque du Soleil, if that's how you pronounce it, did to the circus industry is just unbelievable. Mm. So I'd also recommend reading that. Absolutely. That would be number five on the yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It actually would be number yeah. five. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. There's some amazing books on that shelf for anyone that's watching. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So yeah, the knowing your customer is, is super important, especially when you want to try and attract that customer. I've actually got a story for when I was a child and my, my first business, if you're not watching air quotes quotes um was when i was i think it was five or six and actually showed you the book 101 ways to make money oh yes i, yeah. I didn't bring it in but it's a no book. wonder you ended up in accounting <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in that book it spoke about a lemonade stand so i thought okay this is awesome where i used to live i used to live on the hill and my public school was at the top of the hill so every afternoon at three o'clock the parents and the kids would be would walk past my house to pick their children up or walk back to their cars whatever it may be so me, again, this was actually the most profitable business I've ever had because mum paid for everything and I got all the profit. So thanks, mum. Fantastic. Um, and that taught me about knowing your customer and understanding how traffic works, works. And I didn't think about this until a couple of weeks ago. I was reading one of Russell Brunson's books about traffic that there was a reason we set up shop at three o'clock because that's when everyone was walking past. It was a hot it was a hot day. It was in summer we did it. So there was a need for thirst. We were selling lemonade. So that taught me about understanding traffic and your customer, where they are, who they are, what are their buying habits, and probably they actually probably bought because they thought, oh, what a cute little boy. Take my money. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't- Shocking but, lemonade. Yeah, <laughs> lemonade was terrible. Um, but that, that showed me back then that if you have the, the product in the right area, in front of the right eyes, it's going to work. Regardless if the lemonade was good or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it, right? And so it's building that customer profile. We've actually talked about this a lot on the show over the last few years. A lot of people don't know who they're talking to. Yeah. It's really simple. If you have a physical store, you're a bakery, uh, you can see you got a lot of tradies coming in early morning. They're grabbing pies, they're grabbing uh, ham and salad rolls, they're grabbing that sort of stuff. Well, how much are you making on those ham and salad rolls? How much could those tradies pay? Could they pay more? Um, once you know who it is that you're talking to, you'll be able to determine what type of products, how you're going to price them. Like if you're going to sell uh, a pie, you're not probably not going to sell that too many pies to like, you know, the young kids walking in that just want a donut, for yep. example. So you've got to know who you're talking to when you deliver the products in, at the price that they, they are willing to pay. Uh, so we've got just a couple more things here on the list, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the second from last one is probably going to match up with our, the last uh, part of the accelerator. And it's just about practicing mindfulness or at least techniques that help you manage stress. In a business, anyone will know that um, your mind is scattered at the best of times. And so one of the things, you sh well, there are many things you can do, but some of the things that have really helped me, I don't know if they've helped you guys, which is just writing things down. Um, psychologists love it when you write things down because you can have those breakthroughs at the end of the night. You can clear your mind and that type of thing. Uh, 
another thing to to keep in mind is can you separate your work from home life? A lot of us are working from hybrid working environments at the moment. So you're at home, you're in the office. Try to get yourself um, separated from work, whether it's a different office, whether it's um, you know just having your desk in a different location, something like that. Uh, the next one is some people who work in technical industries, maybe you're an architect, maybe you're a designer, maybe who knows, you're an engineer. Set no meeting days, days when you can not have a meeting. No one can put anything in your calendar, particularly if you have a virtual assistant or a VA, have times in your calendar when they cannot book anything. Now, that could be times when you're picking the kids up from school on a particular day, or maybe it's the day when you want to get deep work done and you need that peace of mind. I know I definitely need them nowadays. I didn't need them in the early days, but I do need them now. Another concept of the workday is peaks and troughs. If you're a morning person, if you're an afternoon person, recognize those things in yourself, but also in your team and set your agenda accordingly. Finally, you mentioned it before, George, which is just time blocking, setting time aside for the things that matter. One really good habit to get in the process of is putting things in your calendar and estimating how long that task is going to take and actually seeing if it does take you that long. And you might find that you're overestimating things or you're underestimating things. If you're underestimating them, pardon me, you will notice because you'll constantly be stretched. You'll be rocking up to meetings late. You'll be doing all those types of things and you will recognize it in yourself. And one little quick hack for Gmail or Microsoft Office users is if you uh, allocate your time, so you can actually like right click on your calendar invite and you can set it as a color or you can categorize it. And at the end of the week, it will automatically calculate how much time you spent on marketing, how much time you spent on ops, how much time you spent on HR. It actually automatically does that. And you can run through months and you can figure out, hold on a second, I'm spending 40% of my time on HR or I'm spending 30% of my time on marketing. And it's just a little thing that pops up on the side of your, yeah, cool. your calendar. There. Didn't know you could do that. Yeah. I'm going to go, as soon as we're done this, I'm going to go. Because yeah, Daniel's doing. calendar is very organized. Yeah, I use, my, calendar. Yeah, yeah. I use my calendar yeah. very, very um, yep. promptly to the point where I even put my weekends into there sometimes if I've got things on. Um, oh, really? I, yeah, I, I use it very, very promptly. I'm going to see if mine comes up color-coded. So uh, for anyone that's watching, you can see it's color-coded. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got this thing down the side that says more insights, and it will show you that I spent last week six and a half hours on marketing. Uh, I spent the next the, the next most common thing was our investors podcast operations uh, and then I didn't categorize some of it which stuffed it up but That's it gives cool. you an insight into where you're spending time so just pick those categories accordingly and, and go from there all right final thing from us for these 20 things is just get some help so you get through this you understand how many different things there are if you want to achieve two three five ten x your sales if you want to make more profit this is why we created the accelerator. You heard it at the top of the show. We want to help more businesses. We want to connect more people. We want you to feel connected to other business owners and people who understand what you're going through. We believe that you should get accountants, that you should get lawyers, you should get people that can help you, give you advice and honest feedback. And that's why we created the community. So you don't have to come to us. You don't have to take part in the accelerator, of course. Uh, you can head to our website and you can download some free stuff so you can get free templates or checklists and that sort of stuff. It's all available in the show notes each and every week. Uh, but if you are interested in joining the Accelerator program, Daniel, Jordan and I are making you an offer. If you do want to join now, we're not going to hammer you with sales and all that sort of stuff going forward. If you want to join, you can get 20% off in the next fortnight and there's only two ways to claim that. Uh, the first way is you go and book a discovery call with Jordan. So you can actually put his sales call to the test. You can actually jump on the call with him and you can speak with him. You can talk to him about your business and we can see how we can actually help you. We can see where you are now and where you want to be in the future. You can just jump on a call. It doesn't cost you anything. Have a chat with Jordan uh, and we'll try and push you in the right direction and tell you if the course is right for you, if the program is right for you, if it's too early, if it's too late. We've had people come in and we've said, it's probably not right. You're probably too early or it's probably not the right fit um, because there are so many things that go into it. Uh, the other way you can join us is if you go to the website, which is available in the show notes. Uh, as I said, it's only for the next fortnight. Uh, come and join us. Come and join the pioneers. Uh, you will find heaps of goodies in there. It's all available in your podcast player. Guys, I'm not going to even do a summary of this episode because we covered so much. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is so much in here from just having the right mindset to building the foundations, 
doing the numbers, so much to cover. This is why it took us so long to build the darn course, um, which is still growing and still expanding at this time. So um, heaps to go on, join the Accelerator program. If you're in the market for growing your business, if you wanna connect with people, if you want a program that you can follow for sales, if you want a sales script, that's what's in the course. These types of things, go and check it out. Um, we'd love to have you on board and hopefully meet you in person over the next few months. Daniel, Jordan, really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Thank you. Thanks, Always man. a pleasure. That was fun.